In the first segment of this two-part video, we focused on the ejection experience of the 92nd Bomb Wing crew, which crashed on the top of Hunts Mesa, Arizona, during their entry into the Holbrook Low Level Route. Now let's turn our attention to the ground survival phase. Let me reset the conditions for you. You'll recall that it was a very dark night. The terrain is highly treacherous. The surface winds are about 30 knots, which drives the wind chill to near zero degrees. Additionally, each of the crew members suffered some form of injury during the ejection and subsequent parachute landing fall. The radar navigator, for example, had compound fractures of both legs. The co-pilot was rendered unconscious during ejection and did not revive until some time after rescuers arrived on the scene. Given these circumstances, it is near miraculous that any of the five men survived. The fact that they did is graphic testimony to the quality of their training, their equipment, their courage, and the heroic efforts of their rescuers, especially the chopper pilots of the 1550th Combat Crew Training Wing. Let me reemphasize here the key message of the first videotape. It can happen to you. Put yourself in the position of these five crew members on top of Hunts Mesa that night. Ask yourself about your memory of basic survival skills, your knowledge of your equipment, and perhaps most important, your will to survive in the face of terrible odds. Okay, when I first came down in the chute, I landed in virtually a uh, soft spot near this road. And the first thing that entered my mind was I knew that we still had winds of about 30 knots that night. So I wanted to get rid of my chute as soon as I landed. So as soon as I landed, I reached for the release covers and got rid of those and got rid of my chute. So there was no concern about the wind after that uh, until later on in the night. So then after I got rid of my chute, matter of fact, after, as I was releasing my, uh, the covers, I was calling out for other people, just uh, using the word hello as loud as I could call. And then I get a response from, uh, it turned out to be the EW, Captain Uronic. And we both continued to call to one another. And as we continued to talk, Captain Uronic came walking over to me as I was getting out of my harness. Once we were out of the harness, we both continued to call for other people. And it wasn't but maybe just a couple of minutes that uh, we got a response from what turned out to be Lieutenant Colonel Daspit, our radar navigator. At that point, we both got together with Captain Uronic's seat kit and uh, we proceeded to from this area back over to my left toward the edge of the mesa to where Lieutenant Colonel Daspit was located. As I was coming down in the chute uh, the first thing I recalled uh, I saw off into this direction another chute so I knew I wasn't alone. I knew I was going to have help out here. I didn't know who it was at the time. And then I got ready for the landing. I, so I, and uh, just as I hit the ground, I could see that I was off to, off to this side was uh, what looked like a total drop off just uh, past this uh, bush here. Uh, as soon as I hit the ground, I knew instantly that I broke both legs. My first concern, although I knew there was people around, was to uh, try to take care of, uh, keep, get warm, take care of the shock, because I, at about that time, I really felt the cold and realized that my uh, jacket was still in the airplane, and I didn't have anything except what I had on, the parachute, which was uh, blowing away, blowing and hung up in the brush here, and then uh, what I had in my seat kit. I started trying to pull the chute in. I couldn't because it was stuck in the brush. Eventually, when uh, Captain Keeney came over, he uh, pulled it over and put it on me. It did provide a surprising amount of warmth. First thing I did was I started reaching in my seat kit, and I did find the ski mask and one of the mittens here, and, but I couldn't find the other mitten. I put the ski mask on the one mitten, and the only thing I could find for the other hand was the uh, ski sock, so I put that on. While I was doing that, I heard uh, Captain Uronic call out uh, asking if there was anyone out here. And I called, told him I was over here, but I had broken legs. He told me that uh, he and the pilot would be over in a little while. And I told him to be careful about 
be careful because I had a big cliff off to the uh, in the opposite direction. I was very concerned about them, uh, you know, stumbling off the edge there. Um, Captain Uronic, uh told me to uh, call out so he could uh, find me by listening for me. Yeah, but even with doing that, I was a little bit concerned. I started digging around in the seat kit and uh, found my uh, found the strobe light. Initially, after landing and leaving the airplane, I got two swings in the chute and uh, looked down, and all I basically saw was the ground coming up to me and uh, got ready to do my PLF. Uh, I was facing generally in the direction behind me and watching a fireball come up as I uh, felt a lot of uh, anxiety and, and loss of the crew members at that time and the loneliness. I didn't really expect anybody else to get out of that uh, intense fireball directly uh, to my rear. and. I felt a lot of relief when, uh, when I heard uh, Bob's voice uh, ringing out in the distance. I immediately answered back to him and at the same time uh, started ripping my uh, sea kit apart, planning to take it with me. Uh, initially, I had pulled the radio out and tried to get uh, some sound or some contact with somebody, hoping that there was an aircraft behind us. However, uh, all the beacons in the area were, were going off all at once and uh, initially I thought that was the beacon of the radio and not the beacons from the chute. Uh, I didn't even think of the time to turn mine off or any of the others throughout the whole ordeal. Uh, I then proceeded to uh, join up with Captain Keeney, as he indicated earlier, where uh, we were both thanking God and uh, being just happy to be alive, the two of us, and at that point, we were hoping that more were alive. Before we started over to Lieutenant Colonel Daspit, we talked about what we need out of the seat kit, and we decided we we're going to take Captain Uronic's seat kit with us and all the, all the contents. And Captain Uronic, well, at that time, uh, wasn't really suffering from anything that uh, caused him any severe pain, and neither was I. I don't really recall even going to the ground, so I had no sprains or anything like that at, at that time. We uh, proceeded from this point over to Lieutenant Colonel Daspit, and then Captain Uronic began to uh, complain about his ankles were hurting, and he also had chest pains. So once he started talking about his chest pains, I just told him to put his arm around me and I would help him over to Colonel Daspit. I uh, got halfway down and then uh, the uh, pain that I had suffered through the ejection started to uh, intensify extremely to the point I had to stop and, and rest a minute before continuing down. There's a log about halfway between Colonel Daspit and where I'm standing here. So I had Colonel or Captain Uronic sit on the log and I continued over to where Colonel Daspit was located found the strobe light I went to found went to turn it on found the button turned it on but uh, I could tell it was uh, tell it was working I could hear the sound as I'd uh, been taught in uh, survival training but I couldn't see the flash then I remembered that the uh, there was a flash suppressor on it for the infrared and I took that off and held it, held the beacon up so that uh, the pilot in EW could find me a uh, short time afterwards, they finally got over there, over here, and uh, at that time, Captain Keeney went and put the uh, beacon up on the uh, bush over here so that uh, to help people try to locate us from across the valley. Once I arrived at Colonel Daspit, uh, I asked him, you know, if he had any kind of severe injuries or anything like that, and as it turned out, he told me that he thought both of his legs were broken. So then I if I, I just took a look at his legs, and it was obvious that both of them were uh, severely broken. And so I just tried to make him as comfortable as possible. Once I got it, I got his chute back over him for warmth and things like that. And then I came back over to where Captain Ironic was located and uh, helped him over to where Colonel Daspit was at. We continue to call out while we're doing all, going through all this process, trying to get a response from the other crew members. Next thing, as they got here, started getting concerned once again of trying to keep warm. Captain Uronic got up next to me, and we had the chute over us. And uh, I had, because of my injuries, I was getting a little frustrated. It re you know, a lot of things I knew should be done, I was just incapable of doing them because I was totally immobile. Um, so as we were sitting here waiting, and uh, Captain Keeney was off looking for Captain Portis, I uh, started keeping uh, Captain Uronic's morale up, you know, talk, telling jokes, uh, just talking, things like that, so we didn't get depressed. And uh, then we, while we were laying there, we started uh, digging into the seat kit, trying to find what was there, what we could use, remembering how to use it, uh, pulled out the radio, t 
turn that on and all I could hear was beepers. And uh, I remember mine was in my pack, reached around trying to get at it, but because of my immobility, I didn't want to move too much. I uh, finally gave that up. At that time, I just wished I had a 38 to put a slug through it to put that out. I also realized with the other shoots around the area, just getting mine out probably wasn't going to do any good anyway. The other things we found were, uh, found the flares and the uh, uh, gyro jet gun and uh, got those out started thinking about how to use them. But um, we eventually didn't use them. First of all, a little bit concerned of using the flares because of the, uh, it was very windy and a lot of dry, brush like this around around the area and the uh, parachute overs didn't want to set that on fire and make things worse. Also later on when the uh, rescue plane came in came over a um, little bit reluctant to use the gyro jet gun because there was quite a few uh, Indians by that time up in the area to help us out. I would guess maybe 10-15 minutes or so we got a response uh, from the navigator uh, Captain Portis. It's, as it turned out, he was about 30 yards or so farther on down from uh, Colonel Daspit. I did as much as I could as far as getting uh, Captain Uronic and Colonel Daspit comfortable. I, we all got their seat kits open. We got the chute over both of them. I had uh, Captain Uronic lay down next to uh, Colonel Daspit. We got the chute over both of them, and I drew his life raft up so he could put his head on the life raft. After they were as comfortable as possible, then I told them to just sit tight and not move around any because you really couldn't see anything that night. You couldn't see what you were walking on. You couldn't tell whether it was bushes in front of you or whether it was a 500-foot uh, cliff. So I just called to Captain uh, Portis to just continue to call so, we could loc so I could locate him. So I just continued to follow his voice and uh, started over the edge of the uh, first incline down to where he was located. Yeah, I remember when I hit the ground, I just kind of fell down there kaplunk. And I was thinking that, you know, I knew Colonel Ivy hadn't had a chance to get out of the airplane. And I could look off in the distance straight ahead and see the fire burning from the final wreckage. And I knew he had perished in there. And I thought the other rest of the crew members may have also perished because I, I made my decision early to get out. And I didn't think they had. And I kind of started crying for a couple of minutes because I started feeling really bad about it. But then I started pulling myself together and saying, well, let's get down to the business of surviving here. And I, uh, I remember thinking the first thing they teach you is to try to contact your other crew members, make contact with somebody. So I started hollering out, you know, just, hey, you know, as, as loud as I could. And for the first few minutes, you know, I didn't hear anybody holler back. So I sat about four or five more minutes and tried it again. Then I heard Bob Keeney's voice hollering. You know, it's a faint voice, and it was back up behind me, and I heard him hollering. So I kept hollering louder, and eventually he kind of worked his way down to me, you know, just homing in on my voice, kind of like a hey, hey. Crawling down over the rocks was, was an experience also. We could, the white rock showed up quite well. We had rocks there as, oh, gee, they were as big as a room, but uh, they were movable. You could just put a hand on them and they would rock. It's that, that kind of thing. And I remember those things going through my mind. I, here we are, four of us at least, uh, we knew of at the time, it survived. And here I'm going to call it, cause a landslide or something like that, where down where Kenny was located. When Bob got the radio, we saw this other B-52 doing figure eights over us, you know, kind of like a search pattern. So. Being fresh out of survival school, I knew exactly what to do with all of the equipment. So first thing I told Bob, yeah, get on the radio and, you know, even tell him how to use it in the dark, you know, how to turn it on and stuff and say, give him a call and see if we can get him. First thing we heard when we turned it on was beakers all over the place. And we tried to talk over them, but it didn't, didn't do any good. So I told Bob to, I said, go, have him go to the backup channel. I said, just keep saying that until, until you get through. And finally they answered, you know, something like Roger, backup channel. And Bob switched over there, and that's where we were able to contact them clearly on the backup channel. The vectoring 
method that, that I used. I could see him for several miles as he was flying figure eights over our position. And uh, I would just give him the left turn, right turn, roll out, that, that kind of thing. And then finally, as, uh, after I got him on a heading that was flying directly toward us, I just gave him the countdown method, five, four, three, two, and, and that type of thing. So he pinpointed our location, and he told me that he was passing on those coordinates to a 130 that was already being dispatched to our area. So he passed the coordinate, coordinates to those guys, and uh, shortly after that, uh, he told us that they were going to be leaving our area, and the 130 would be there within a few minutes. When Captain uh, Keeney came over, it was pitch black by that time. There was no light from the fires, so we were trying to fill, find something for light. And uh, there wasn't any uh, flashlights or anything in the kit. And I did remember that I had a small flashlight in my uh, flight suit pocket. So I gave it, uh, took it out and gave it to Captain Keeney. And although it was almost dead, it did provide just a little bit of light, mostly for look at things and uh, trying to read, read, uh, read what was on uh, pieces of survival gear and stuff like that. If it had have been uh, fully charged, it would provide just a little, little bit more help. But this was basically, this was all we had until we uh, eventually got a fire started when the Indians showed up. Everything took a real long time. What would take a, a short time in a classroom situation was, like they say, extended out there. And things that would take five minutes to do normally, all of a sudden took 45 to 50 minutes to do. So that, that, that was a, a real factor you have to face, or we face at that time. After I ejected, I landed on the second outcropping of Ridgeline across this ravine here. My first real re recollection uh, after the ejection was waking up and an individual was building a fire around me. I asked him who he was and he says, I'm from the Arizona Department of Public Safety. I'm going to build a fire around you because it's cold and snowy out here. At that point, I was in, in a daze still and wasn't really aware of what was going on around me. My next uh, recollection then is of the helicopter when it came to pick me up. And you can't say enough for uh, their ability that night to get to us. As you can see, it's very rugged terrain over there, very uneven with a lot of boulders. The, uh, my perception or conception of the survival experience is much different from the other crew members because I was unconscious or in a daze most of the evening. Uh, some lessons I've learned from since, since being out here today and seeing the rugged terrain is that when you're in a situation like that, you really need to ascertain what's around you before you, you move about trying to uh, uh, search the area. Another thing that uh, occurs to me is the importance of a coordinated effort in any kind of rescue effort. As you can see, with us scattered throughout this whole area here, everyone has to keep their wits about them, keep, uh, keep in touch with each other, and keep a coordinated effort going. But Captain Keeney was able to do that that night and direct a helicopter in to pick me up, as well as care for the needs and the comforts of the other crew members. I thought that, you know, initially they'd have no problem finding us. I thought that helicopter would be coming, you know, over the hill within minutes after the crash, but that doesn't happen. So you have to set yourself up for that, for that fact that you're going to be there for a while and you're going to have to sit. In our situation, it was real life. We were there. We couldn't see very well. We knew what we had in our seat kit due to the training and stuff that we've had, which I also think has been excellent. Uh, but as far as being able to utilize what we've got in a timely manner, it's entirely different. We knew it wasn't going to be too long because of the fact that we had the town not too far from us. We had the radios and that type of thing. But uh, organization is very important. Keep things together and, uh, and get things done. Work together if you've got somebody with you. and. Uh, uh, try to get things as organized as possible is basically what